We have many reasons to pray to our, our great God, but he does ask us to come to him for the things that we seek from him, but also to give him thanks. So I'm going to ask Kerry if she will now come to lead us in prayer. Thank you. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus and his redeeming work on the cross. Thank you that through your mighty power he rose to life again, conquering sin and death and Satan. Thank you that our only hope is by grace alone, through faith in Jesus alone, through whom you offer us salvation and eternal life with you. Thank you that those of us you have chosen, you chose even when you knew just how depraved our sinful natures were and how we would continue to sin against you every day of our lives. Thank you that you send your Holy Spirit to live within those of us who respond in faith to your Son so that we have your power to do good works that you prepared in advance for us to do. And you do all this because of your great love for us and your faithfulness to your creation. We can only say a humble thank you. The Apostle Paul tells us not to be anxious for anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present our requests to you. So Father, thank you that you hear our prayers for the many needs of our world as well as ourselves. Firstly, we pray for the ministry arm of our New South Wales Presbyterian Churches, Jericho Road. Thank you that their vision and work is firmly planted in your word and specifically what you tell all of us to do in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, to seek justice and love mercy so that your character is demonstrated throughout New South Wales. There is so much need in our state among those affected by the recent floods, those still struggling with drought, those still recovering from the bushfires, the needs of refugees, the children and staff at Alloa Children's Hospital, chaplains in prisons and hospitals, our disability services, and the child and adult protection work within our churches. Lord, all these need a prayerful foundation coming from all our churches. Please give those who lead Jericho Road and their various ministries wisdom and the resources to do your work so that you are glorified and many people are drawn to you in life-changing faith. Secondly, we lift up to you Saudi Arabia, where Satan has a tight grip because it is illegal to practice any other religion than Islam. Yet we can have great hope for the Saudi people because you tell us that people from every nation, tribe, people and language will stand before your throne in worship. So we ask, Lord, even though Saudi Christians face the very real risk of being imprisoned and even killed, that you will give them boldness to share the gospel to the, so that the Saudi church will grow. Please ensure new believers will receive the support and discipleship they need to remain faithful to Jesus. And we boldly ask that you will change the hearts and faith of those in leadership so that they come to know Christ as their Saviour and Lord. Thirdly, Father, three countries in our region all have overwhelming needs at the moment. Myanmar needs peace. Timor-Leste needs assistance to recover from the devastating floods. And PNG, in the face of the escalating COVID situation, needs wisdom for its leaders, protection of healthcare workers and a slowing of the spread of the virus. We are a wealthy nation and you have given us more than enough resources to assist all three of these countries. Please, Father, stir our government to hear the cries for help and to respond generously. Father, you have also given each of us more wealth than we need. So, Holy Spirit, please prompt us individually to give generously to APWM's appeal 
for the recovery work in Timor-Leste. Fourthly, we pray for the staff and students of the Presbyterian College in India, where at least 15 staff and students are ill with COVID. Some are in need of admission to ICU, but no beds are available for them. Please, Lord, heal them. Give them peace to rest in your faithfulness. Stop the spread of the virus within the college. Father, also we lift up to you our Queen and her family. Please comfort them in their deep sorrow with the knowledge that you have conquered the pain of death and offer forgiveness and eternal life to anyone who will accept Christ as Lord. Be close to the Queen and comfort her through your word and in prayer as she grieves the death of her husband, who she loved for so very long. Finally, we pray for our church family, Lord. How we need your Holy Spirit to renew our hearts every day. We need your Holy Spirit to drive each of us to prayer and to your word, to seek you and your will for us individually and corporately. We need your Holy Spirit to establish love and faith for you deeply in each of our hearts so that we become more and more like Christ towards each other and to those outside our church who so desperately need to turn to Jesus for salvation. Protect each of us from false teaching, idolatry, and the empty enticements that this world offers. And in and through your Holy Spirit, strengthen us to hear, receive, hold on to and obey the truths we hear each Sunday as your word is opened up to us. Please, Father, give wisdom to the Presbytery team who are now deciding what recommendations to present to Presbytery concerning the future of our church. Help each of us to trust that you will work everything according to your purpose and will. Father, we commit ourselves to you afresh today and pray all these things in the powerful name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.
We're going to uh, have our uh, second reading, which is the passage we're looking at today, uh, John 8, verses 31 to 42. Uh, So please open your Bibles to John 8, uh, and um, Joan is bringing that reading for us now. Thank you, Joan. So John chapter 8. To the Jews who believed in him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in a family, but a son belongs to it forever. So the son sets you free. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. I am am telling you what I have seen in the father's presence and you are doing what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. This is the word of the Lord. So uh, please keep your Bibles there. Um, We're going to have a look at that passage, particularly the first six verses. Um, So um, before we do that, let me pray. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we hear the words of Jesus in this passage and sometimes we find his words not only hard to understand but hard to hear, hard to take on. But we know he spoke them to us in love. But as Kerry prayed, we need your Holy Spirit uh, to show us the truth, a truth that sets us free, as Jesus says. And please have your spirit work in our hearts and our minds as we look at your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, many of us would certainly be aware uh, of the great 20th century evangelist Billy Graham. Uh, In fact, I know for a number of you, he had a great impact in your life. Now, when Billy Graham started out uh, in the mid-1940s on his travels of preaching at Youth for Christ rallies and even travelled preaching throughout Europe, I'm not sure many of us would know that he actually shared the podium, often taking it in turns, you know, one night on, one night off, with another charismatic, uh, talented preacher evangelist. 
This guy was probably actually considered the senior of the two, being a, a little older, and he came from a broadcasting background in the media. He'd founded a church that quickly outgrew its 1,200-seat capacity. At the time, American magazines said he set a new standard for mass evangelism. His name was Charles, or Chuck, Templeton. Have you heard of him? Unfortunately, not long after this time, Templeton began to doubt his unbeliefs and, relying on his own reasoning, concluded that there, if there was suffering in this world, there could not be a loving God. He started to doubt the word of God and even tried to convince Billy Graham that he was outdated with his thinking uh, and simply could not accept the Bible as God's inerrant word. Templeton stepped away from ministry totally and would call himself an agnostic. Now, his definition uh, of, a te- uh, of an ag- agnostic was that he would not deny the possibility of there being a God, but he could not know. And so he could no longer place his faith in that possibility. Now it was from his own reasoning that he would say uh, not long before his death that he found it impossible to believe. On the other hand, Billy Graham, deeply disturbed by his good friend, they were very close friends, and Billy saw him not long before he died. He, couldn't, he was really disturbed by his friend turning his back on Jesus. And he went away and searched the scriptures for answers. He prayed and pondered until finally, in a heavy-hearted walk in the moonlit mountains near his home in North Carolina, with Bible in hand, dropped to his knees, confessed he could not answer all of Chuck Templeton's questions. But in that moment, he felt freed by the Holy Spirit to pray as he said, Father, I am going to accept your word by faith to allow faith to go beyond my intellectual questions and doubts. In this, Billy Graham would have been one of those, Jesus would say, you are really my disciple. As we will see as outlined in this passage. In what we look at today, we find verses and words of Jesus um, that help us understand whether we truly belong to Jesus or not. When we consider the case of faith as it is shown in the lives of Chuck Templeton and Billy Graham, well, it seems black and white, doesn't it? Quite clear who of the two would be a disciple of Jesus. However, it's not always so clear looking from the outside. And even from the inside, when we consider our own lives, we can be asking ourselves, am I really a disciple of Jesus? The thing is, there are no grey areas of discipleship. You are a disciple or you're not a disciple. These verses in what Jesus says helps helps us understand and shows us that there are three hallmarks, as Jesus says and outlines for us, of a genuine believer. Firstly, you hold on to the teachings of Jesus. And secondly, a genuine believer is one who comes to know the truth. And third, you are no longer a slave, but a son. Now, just as there are no grey areas for true discipleship when it comes to faith, that is being a genuine believer, there are no uh, grey areas to be one or the other, genuine believer or not. This is really important to understand because you're either with Jesus or you're not. There's no middle ground because there is one thing that is also very true. There is no grey area for sin. We don't get judged as a bit of a sinner or as a big sinner. Simply that we are all sinners who need to be rescued from that sin by Jesus. And sin can simply be described as being self-centred. That is, not having Jesus as Lord and the centre of our lives. And we all fail at that. 
I was listening to a talk while I was out for a walk during the week, you know, earphones in, uh, and I, um, I was listening to this talk that was given some years ago by the late John Chapman, um, Chapo. I'm sure some of you would have, you'd know who Chapo is. He had a great way of explaining things. He said he used to go to what he called, what they were called as dialogue dinners, where he used to do what he called throwing a brick into a fowl house. It was a method that once thrown, they all squawk at once. He would say in this dinner, he would just pronounce, it is not possible to be more sinful than the people in this room. Well, that would get your attention, wouldn't it? And I'm sure I'd get your attention if I said, it is not possible to be more sinful than the people in this church. Sounds like I'm saying, well, you're actually worse than other people. But that's not what is being said. As Chapo went on to explain, he said, it's the same as saying, you can't be more Australian than Australian. You're either Australian or you're not. Same as sin, except we don't get the option of not being a sinner. We all are. We don't become sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. You may be someone who people can point to as a lawbreaker, clearly doing the wrong thing and so rebelling against God. Or be someone who can be kind, generous, be at church every Sunday, but still rebel against God by not submitting to him through his son, Jesus, as your Lord. And we are all desperately in need of Jesus. And we need to be disciples. So let's see what Jesus says about that. So we start with the first point, holding to Jesus' teachings, uh, which we see in verse 31. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. For those of you uh, who were here last week, um, you might recall we finished off that section about uh, Jesus when you know, remember he was saying he was going away and who can follow him and who can't follow and why. Well, in verse 30, if you've got your Bibles open, you'll see it there. Um, it finished off by saying, Those who heard Jesus speak, many believed in him. So now uh, Jesus in verse 31 seems to be speaking uh, to these professed believers. But there's a slight difference between the two verses, 30 and 31, that may point to what sort of belief Jesus uh, may be addressing here. Scholars argue a bit about the finer points, but it would seem we have some believers who are like those mentioned earlier in John. Remember we spoke about those, that their belief might be best described as shallow. And verse 30 speaks about those who believed in him. And verse 31, the Jews who had believed. Perhaps there are some who did place their faith in Jesus. They believed in him as the one he claimed to be. But perhaps here, Jesus is addressing those who believed Jesus was a good rabbi even as one sent by God. The sort of belief we hear from people today. Yes, I believe Jesus existed. He was a good man and a good teacher. They even believe he was crucified, but they don't believe in him. They are not amongst those who Jesus is about to describe as being really my disciples. So who are those, Jesus would say, are really my disciples? I actually prefer other translations uh, that say, truly, my disciples. It's a more accurate rendering of the Greek. And true is really a a stronger word. And Jesus says to be a true disciple, you are one who will hold to my teaching. Again, the ESV and older translations, well, here they say, if you abide in my word which is not only a more literal translation, but a great way to be thinking about it. So what Jesus is saying is much deeper than simply agreeing with his teaching or his word, but really holding on to it, abiding in it. 
So those with your Bibles, keep your finger in the current spot where we're at. But if you turn a few chapters along to chapter 15 of John, we're going to look at verse 7. Here Jesus is speaking to his inner circle of disciples. And he's speaking to them on the very last night there together before Jesus is crucified. And he says to them, If you remain in me and my words remain in you. If you remain. Remain here in Greek is exactly the same word as we see used in chapter 8 verse 31. If you hold to or abide or remain in my word. So what does that mean? What does it even look like? Now perhaps some parents here might remember summer days, or maybe when you were a kid, when you would head to the beach and you'd take your kids along and the kids would spend the whole day in the water. You'd have to drag them out of the water for lunch. And if you were like my mum, you, were made, you made your kids wait half an hour before heading back into the water which for them seems a lifetime. And then you would need to pack up and head home and you'd call them and they'd plead for just five more minutes. Five more minutes when they're already wrinkled like a prune but want to stay in the water. What would we say about them? They were in their element. You know, for some it might be riding a horse. I don't know if anybody here rides a horse or a motorbike. Or some of us just on a bushwalk or reading a book, whatever it is. Whatever that is, we are so comfortable and enjoying it, we say we are in our element. That's what Jesus is describing in verse 31. What it means to hold on to his teachings, to abide in his word, to be in our element by being in him. The Apostle John, in one of his letters that we find later in the New Testament, 1 John, he, in that book he talks about false teachers who, he says, have gone out from the church, away from the church. They went from the church because they were never really in the church in the first place. They were not in their element. So by holding on to or abiding in Jesus' words, he is saying that if you do not hold to them, his words... His truths that have come to us in the Gospels, things like the incarnation, that Jesus is God in flesh who came to dwell among us, or that he is the Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice, by being the perfect man who can remove our sins by his death. A death that was vindicated and vindicated his perfection and his divinity by rising from the dead we don't hold to these things and Jesus' teaching as we hear here, if we don't hold to these things, we don't abide in them, live in them, then Jesus will tell us when he returns, he never knew us. We don't belong to him. Upholding his words is not only continuing in belief but being in obedience to them. And that will not be easy. We will not fit into what society expects of people. We will slip up. But Jesus says to continue to hold on to his word. I don't know if you remember, it was a while back now, but back in chapter 6 when Jesus, remember he had quite a few disciples, they were following him, and then they heard similar teaching to what Jesus is teaching here. And we read in John 6.66, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. They weren't true disciples. It was too hard. And they, they said, they, just, they find this teaching hard. Only 12 would stick with him and one of them would not last. So just before we leave this verse, we also should understand what is meant by the term disciple. The literal meaning is student, one who engages in learning through instruction from another, a learner. If you are to be 
one who abides in Jesus' words and call ourselves true disciples, then we must also acknowledge we never get off our ill plates. We are to always be learning. If you think you're beyond that, if you, uh, you already know enough to be a true disciple and there's no need to learn anymore, then by the very definition of the word, you are not a disciple. So the second mark that Jesus tells us of a genuine believer, a true disciple, is one who comes to know the truth. Unlike the experience of Chuck Templeton, who who tried to reason his beliefs or doubts using his own power of reasoning, well, there was the Billy Graham experience where he looked to God's word, prayed and came to a moment when he knew the Holy Spirit was working in his life and, as he said, freed him to put his faith in Jesus. This is the sort of freedom Jesus means when he says in verse 32, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The freedom to know the truth, a truth that saves us by freeing us from our sins. So what is that truth? Again, in the conversation Jesus had with his disciples, his close disciples on the night before, that he was betrayed, he makes that plain. In chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But he also explains in that same conversation how we get to know this is truth. A little later, in verses 16 and 17 of chapter 14, he says, And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. You see, we can't have the Christ of truth and not the spirit of truth and vice versa. Once uh, we have the Christ of truth, that we believe in him and abide in his word, then the spirit of truth begins to work in our lives to help us learn and understand the truth so that we can have faith. A truth that sets us free, that helps us with the why questions. You know, the why questions, they're always so much harder to come to grips with than the how questions. The why we are here type questions. Why do things happen the way they do? Why is there suffering in the world? Christians, even true disciples of Jesus, our our freedom to know the truth won't give us all the answers, even through the spirit of truth. But you will come to know the most important answer you will need to know. The answer to the question of why God sent Jesus into the world. The answer, Christ is the truth that sets us free. He frees us into his truth that frees us from sin. He is the only way. We then see that those that Jesus was speaking to, the Jews who believed him, well, they just didn't understand about this freedom. In fact, instead of believing, they rejected what Jesus said straight off. We are descendants of Abraham, they say in verse 33, claiming they are already free and always have been. Apart from forgetting as a people they were enslaved by Egypt, the Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, Greeks and currently enslaved by the Romans, they claim their heritage grants them freedom. Now they're speaking about an inner freedom. They think they are home free because of who they are, the promises made to Abraham. They expect to automatically inherit. Sadly, Too many people think their righteousness before God comes from the deeds of others on their behalf. But my parents, they were devout, very strong Presbyterians or Baptists or Anglicans, whatever. 
my husband, my wife, you know, they're strong in their faith. That's got to mean something. I was born a Presbyterian, baptised and married in a Presbyterian church. That's got to count for something. There is no brownie point system that grants us a freedom through heritage. The Jews only need to read their own scriptures to see that even for Abraham, the promises that God made to him were no good if he didn't believe them. There would be no righteousness granted to him. We heard that in Jones' reading when it came uh, to God's promises. We read, uh, Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. He believed in promises that through his line God would pass on blessings to those who, like Abraham, would believe. Now, Abraham might not have known this blessing would be manifested in the person of Jesus, but he had faith God would fulfil his promises. And so he received the righteousness before God that comes through Jesus, the one promised hundreds of years before. Otherwise, as Jesus says in verse 34, very true, truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Which brings us to the third mark of being a genuine believer, knowing you go from slave to son. Now I use the word son here deliberately. Now, it may not be politically correct these days. However, not only is it the word that John uses as he writes, but in the context of its day, it demonstrates the fullness of the blessing that comes from Jesus when he says, Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. When the Jews denied ever being enslaved, you know, we know they were actually speaking about their inner freedom. You know. Never was that overrun, they said. It makes them no different from anybody else. Isn't that what everybody in the world is striving for? Inner freedom? As Jesus points out, our real problem is that we are slaves to sin. We cannot have the freedom we crave because even from within, it's corrupted by sin. We can't break free from the bondage that this corruption brings, which is self-centeredness. Putting ourselves before anyone or anything else, including God. You won't escape, nor can you escape. So these words of Jesus gives us a whole new way of life. As slaves... Slaves must obey. There's no option. So if we are slaves to sin, guess what it is we are obeying? A slave has no heritage or inheritance. There is nothing to come to them. There is no hope for them. He or she cannot do what they want to do, but only what they are told to do. There is no freedom, not even inner freedom. People have always strived to free themselves. From the 19th century, we saw a great movement from philosophers trying to free themselves and others from religion. The thinking was that it it is religion that burdens us with legalism. They wanted to be freed from always having to do good. That's exactly the sort of religion that Jesus hated too a legalistic religion that the Pharisees were burdening their people with. What sets us free is that God gives us a spirit, as promised by Jesus, that sees us want or desire to do his will. Now that doesn't mean we won't fail or be sinless, but we go from no hope to new hope. That's what Jesus is talking about in these verses. Instead of slaves with no permanent place in the family, We become sons through the Son. In the first century context, unlike today, a daughter could not inherit from the father. 
only sons. So we, as God's children, we become inheritors through his son, given the full rights of a son. We will inherit the Father's kingdom. Where then is our faith? Do we reason and bargain with God under our own self-centred conditions? Even tell him he's not there like Chuck Templeton did? Or abide in his word? Are we continuing in his word? Or was it just in that initial moment when we became Christians and we wanted Jesus in our lives? Do we have a personal knowledge of Jesus, know his truth, trusting him in his promise that the Holy Spirit will teach us the truth like Billy Graham entrusted himself? Are we a child of God's and not a slave to sin? Do we have a new hope and a new new nature? A nature through the Spirit who cements in us the truth of Jesus that sets us free. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we are slaves to sin. We put ourselves at the centre of our own lives. We push Jesus aside rather than submit to him as Lord. But you have promised your, your Holy Spirit will dwell with us and teach us when we continue to hold on to or abide in Jesus' words. Please have your spirit work in us to know we are now freed from sin and to serve Jesus as our King, to be the Lord of our lives and to know him as our Saviour and Rescuer. Amen.